Oh, my guests have arrived. <laughs> my family. The Kwekwe. Bojo. Welcome to uh, my home. And the key, uh, I take my machine. Today I'm going to uh, share a bit of story with you about uh, our participation as an Anishinaabe community in the making of uh, the treaty that uh, covers this uh, part of the, uh, the territory. And I'm going to uh, share a view which is uh, coming from being in Anishinaabek. At around the time of 1850, which is when uh, the treaty was made on September 9th in that year, my grandfather sat with our community and he asked about uh, what we should look for in sitting down to participate in this uh, making of a, an agreement. So when we think about uh, our people coming here to this particular place to host a, uh, a meeting, to talk about uh, what was important for our community to keep. At the core of that was uh, the idea of the land. So we are having to go back before the making of the treaty to take a look at uh, how we were living, what some of that story looks like from that time. And in my lifetime, I always go back to the period 1763, the years just before and the years just after. Because in that year, 1763 and 1764, okay, two uh, important events occurred, which are of a uh, global in nature. So in that time of 1763, our people were already face facing a lot of pressure in coming into contact with our Euro European uh, neighbors. Our peoples here in North America were being drawn into their conflicts and uh, suffering from the outcomes of uh, those kinds of uh, pressures. And we go back into that time just before the Anishinaabeg people from this particular territory here and our neighbors, okay, which are close by around the Great Lakes down to St. Lawrence and uh, to the west. We began to hear stories about uh, encounters with the Europeans. And we had at the time had some contact with the, uh, with the English coming from the north side and then coming from the south side, but the French were coming from the middle along the, along the St. Lawrence. So our language terms in relation to those peoples, we speak of uh, the French contact as Wemtegoji, and we speak about the English contact as uh, Shaganash. And inside those words, when you begin to uh, take a look at what they are saying, I'll use the, um, the English because that's where we are speaking today and primarily in terms of how we relate with, with Canada. But what the, uh, the term uh, Jaganash speaks about a time. It captures a moment about first contact. So the term references uh, the uh, appearance of the people that came off that uh, little ship. If you can imagine going across the ocean for three months without the modern convenience of today. Not being able to shower, not having good food, not having uh, a lot of uh, amenities. So when the people emerged, they were quite sick. 
And that's what the Javanese term is describing. Yeah, a person that has not been able to uh, wash, a person that was not able to uh, feed well, a person was showing a lot of um, illness and um, lacking care. So our contact with them describes this, this kind of a, a moment in time with, within that word, Jagannath. It describes a, a person that's not well. So by our law and our uh, practices, our obligations towards people is described in the language Ge Abanoji and um, the Nishnabek. So when you analyze those words, it talks about law which relates to providing care, okay? reaching out to help people. And that's what our people did at those first contact times. And we have never lost okay, those views in terms of how we are to live. So those concepts are what we protected in the making of the treaty that we entered into with the Crown from Great Britain. But in that 1763 time frame, we were being drawn into this conflict that European nations were engaged in. There was a war over in Europe that was being carried on between the English and the French. And our people on this side were being drawn into uh, taking sides. And on the Plains of Abraham, okay, when we hear about those stories, when you go back and study the history of grade seven, grade eight times, we hear about the names Wolf and Montcalm. And our people at the time were feeling some pressure because both of these nations were trying to recruit our people to participate in their war efforts. So our young men were being drawn into these two camps. And it altered some of our living arrangements that we were already secure in. We had made peace earlier okay, with our Six Nations Confederacy brothers. And out of that peace that we made with the Six Nations Confederacy, we created this treaty of addition with one spoon. So that idea of there's only one globe and we all take our life from that earth okay, is captured in, the, in this treaty. So the same concept which is in that treaty that we made with the Six Nations Confederacy is carried on in the treaty that we made with Great Britain. And that's part of that 1763, 1764 time frame that people don't well know about. But in 1764, we uh, sat down with Great Britain again and uh, we began to share with Britain some of our concerns about uh, the war, the wars that we were uh, being asked to participate in that were being fought between the English and the French. And in 1763, English, okay, the English government was successful in terms of its uh, defeat of the French. And that's something very significant because out of that, there was a, uh, a treaty made between England and France. And uh, in the treaty that was made between England and France, there's articles of capitulation that we have to look at. And this is significant for Canada because out of that agreement, say we see today uh, questions coming from Quebec about uh, their holding, about their, uh, their presence, about how they are living within this idea of confederation but you've got to go back and take a look at the 1763 event of that war. What occurred at the time was uh, when France lost that conflict over in Europe where the battle was being raged, the French people became aliens in their own house. If you can imagine, suddenly your entire nation becomes victim to a uh, warring neighbor, and you lose. So Britain acquired okay, in this war through the surrender of France. If they had wanted to, they could have pursued more fully the takeover of France, but they didn't. Okay. And they saw reason in uh, not doing so because of uh, the uh, anxieties and animosities that would be uh, 
lived and carried. They were coming through civil wars in their own country, and they could see this being perpetuated. So they uh, made an arrangement of peace whereby France was allowed to keep their homelands. But in North America, what, the, what happened with the French was that they uh, were treated as though they were objects. If you think about Christmas giving, you wrap a nice package up and you put an object inside and you give a gift to a person that you may be living with a family member or a, a neighbor. Well, in the case of France, what happened was that they were treated like an object. The people en masse were put together collectively and wrapped up into this big bundle, like a big Christmas gift. And they were given to Britain as a compensation for the loss in the war, to uh, compensate Britain for its uh, war effort. So France became an object. The French people became an object that was owned by Great Britain. Okay, that was a, a very kind of strange thinking that we came into contact with at that time. So in terms of our, our community here, we were seeing events that were difficult to understand. How other people were living, how other people were treating one another. And we were concerned about them coming here to treat us in the same way. So Pontiac rallied at that time to remind these European nations and peoples that what they were bringing was not welcome because it was uh, disturbing, it was upsetting, it was very dangerous. And Pontiac fortunately had the foresight to see how uh, the world was coming to be divided and people were claiming uh, ideas like ownership and title of lands over which they had never visited. And we saw that when uh, we look at the term that the French used to describe who they are. Okay, but our description of them, we say that it went to Goji. So when they came onto the land, they brought with them okay, their priest, and they brought with them their flag, and they brought with them their, their people and their, their practices. So when they touched the land with their flag and they touched the land with their crucifix, and that's what Wimta Goji is describing, touching the land with these crosses, they laid claim to the land. And it was as though we became unnecessary and we became a nuisance, we became just unwelcome. And we were just totally to be replaced. So we began to see the behavior like that okay, from that kind of contact. So we always saw this kind of a, a pressure, exposure, in terms of our having to live with the uh, visits okay, from the, those, those nations and those, those, those peoples. So we, again, it's, uh, you can see from that history and exposure what our people would be having to look at in terms of uh, making adjustments in the way that we're having to live. So when we sat down in 1764, that's in part what was uh, being discussed. We uh, reminded England and France, but primarily when we sat down with the English in 1764, the questions were raised about uh, our taking a side, our becoming friends. And the English were saying at the time, um, if you continue to follow offers which are coming from other nations, other, other peoples, you may not be happy with the results that they bring with them. But I make gestures to you, I make over, overtures to you about how I'm going to treat you because I'm wanting to continue to thrive here, I'm wanting to continue to live here. And I would like to become friends with you to uh, enjoy a, a life of living 
together in harmony. So Britain, their, their agents, began to speak in this kind of a approach, this kind of a uh, continuance of a, of relationship. So in 1764, we sat down to talk with Britain. Before we sat down with Britain, we said, oh, but before we sit down and talk with you, you're going to have to go and sit on the side of here because we, there's something that we have to do among ourselves. And that's what our people did. Okay, we sat down among ourselves. And in uh, the agreement that we made among ourselves, we talk about a 24-nation agreement because at the time, what happened in 1763, 1764, we couldn't meet in 1763 after the conclusion of the war in Europe because our people were going out to their hunting territories, going out onto the lands. It was too late in the year to call an assembly together to sit down and meet. But they said, we'll meet with you next year. And that's what was arranged. Runners were sent out across the lands, across the territories of North America to invite delegations of people to come and sit down to talk about their entering into your arrangement with Great Britain coming from the other side of the Great Salt Water. So our people sat there to engage among ourselves about what it is that we were to do. And we were concerned because we were seeing this kind of a pressure of people being forced from their lands. So we made an agreement among ourselves to form our own confederation, and that's what we did. So we end up with this 24 nation covenant. So in a belt that has been made to commemorate that outcome of that, of that gathering, we talk about a 24 nation agreement, 24 nation confederacy. So what we did was we extended our interests. So when we start talking about the Robinson Huron Treaty, what are the interests that you have? We talk about main, the maintenance of our tie with our land, our sovereignty over our possession of our holding of the lands. That was secured in the making of the treaty, but it was it was beyond a, a local territory, like talking about a postage stamp. We spoke among ourselves as nations in 1763, 1764 primarily, about having to take care of one another as nations. So the 24 nation agreement that we made, this is what it's about. We made a treaty among ourselves. And today, that treaty, it's what we enjoy. So we, there's a, a history that's needing to be shared with our nations. And I remember 1978 going to Ottawa and I was speaking on the assembly floor there to the chiefs. I was a young chief at the time from our, coming from our community, speaking for our people. And I was saying to them, we are here. When we come here, we're speaking as nations. We're not Indian bands, we're not Indians. We are coming here as nations. So out of that, there was a, a declaration made. We formed our own group and we made it known that what we secured in 1764 in the making of our treaty arrangement and agreement among ourselves, we protected in 1978 at the, the uh, introduction of the, con the Constitution of Canada. Mm -hmm. And we traveled to Britain, okay, that's a different kind of a story there, but we protected ourselves. So in 1764, we sat down, we made agreement among ourselves to say that my interest in terms of being an Anishinaabek doesn't stop at the drainage basin of the Great Lakes. My interests go down to the saltwater coasts, okay, down on the Atlantic, down on the Gulf of Mexico, to the north of the Arctic Ocean, and the west of the Pacific. And among ourselves, we made agreement to take care of one another because we saw this kind of pressure coming to us about being pushed out of our own house, about, from our own lands. So we reached out to one another to take care of and secure with one another our future. So in 1764, we had this history behind us because my grandfather was there. Chief Wawano, and he brought that story home, home with him. Okay. So in 1763, we come through, the grandparents, okay. they bring with them the stories. So in 1850, my grandfather, okay. again, was invited 
to go and sit down and participate in the making of another agreement. But in 1764, we sat down to make that silver covenant. But we sat down with Britain and we gave Britain permission to come in and live with us in our home. But we said to them, we make this agreement that will last forever. And this is a, what we call an inviolable agreement. Inviolable meaning it can never be broken. Right? So we sat down with Britain and gave them permission to come and live on our lands with us. And it's through Britain that all the other nations come, okay, through the British North America Act. So we understand that because we participated in its being put into place. So I sit with Canada today and I talk about what Canada is carrying. Canada didn't exist at the time the treaty was made, 1850. They were still here carrying the title of being a province. Provinces are lower orders of government, they're not nations. They don't make treaties. So we made a treaty with Great Britain, but Canada has become the administrator of that treaty. It carries legal obligations that were created through the making of treaty and through the making of the British North America Act. So in 1850, when Canada didn't exist, the treaty that we made with Great Britain secured the idea that we're dealing as sovereign to sovereign. So I'm a sovereign as an individual. And when I sit with Canada, I remind him about this kind of position and standing that I carry with me. So sometimes people don't understand. They can't relate to the concepts because they've been given different teaching. So in my case, let's say, my parents and our family, our community, has been keeping alive what is our inheritance, our inherent rights, our inherent presence, our inherent being. Those are still, in, still intact. So I invited the university to come and make the radio here in my home. I said, I would like you to come over to my, to my house into my home, to the place where our family is gathered before they sat down in making the treaty and talked about what it is that we're going to look after. What is it that we have to secure so that the children that are to come are gonna have a place to live. They're gonna continue to have their own home and a place that they were born to, which is described inside the language when you say Abenoji, when you look at the term Anishinaabek, those two are tied together and they're protected inside the treaty. So in 1850, my grandfather, Shawanagizik, I carry the same name spiritually. He met with the people here in our community and he asked, what should I protect? And they spoke about the land. So in the treaty, that's what he describes. So when you go to the treaty, and I have a copy in my satchel that I brought with me here, it talks about Whitefish Lake, the Tikmikshing. And each community has a story about how their people got together and t to take a look at how they were going to engage with Canada, how they were going to engage, not with Canada, but uh, engage with Great Britain in the making of this uh, living arrangement. So our people sat down and secured okay, our sovereignty, our freedom. And that's what the, the treaty speaks about. Okay, the treaty is about okay, sovereigns. The treaty is about okay, free people coming together to make living arrangements. And the treaty is the international mechanism, okay, the international mechanism which is used by nations to form okay, agreements, to form living arrangements, to, sec to secure to them, unto themselves their rights and interests. So when we take a look at this agreement that we made with Great Britain, okay, when Canada came into being, okay, there's a section 109 that's not well known. But when Canada came together, it was formed 
through legislation that was passed in Great Britain. It wasn't passed in Canada. Canada didn't have authority. They had to go back to the what, what's referenced as the imperial government. So in the making of the treaty, the representatives that were here did not like the idea that they had to go back to Great Britain. And you can see in some of the instructions when you go back and look at the historical documents and records, they question the need to go back to Great Britain and get that sanction, get that permission. So you see some of that. So when uh, Mr. Robinson came to participate in the making of the treaty, he receives some instruction about what he was to do. And you see direction coming from the Governor General of the time. He says to Mr. Robinson that you will use deviance. You will use misleading argument to try to gain advantage. You will become devious, you will behave in that manner. And you're not to let them know that you're acting in this way. So with the making of the treaty, our people were looking at the ideas of uh, moral conduct. So before the actual make, making of the treaty, they sat down and had ceremony. Like which I'm sitting beside here, we have a spiritual fire. And this fire here, when we light that one up, you go back and go into a sense of reflection. You take a look at yourself. You take a look at what you are going to be asked to participate in. And you ground yourself in your foundations of who you are as a people, as individuals. So you look at your moral security. You look at your health and well-being. You look at your future. You look at your past. You go into the period of reflection. You think about what is it that I'm being asked to do. So it's in ceremony you take time to go back and visit with those questions so that you're able to build a foundation from which to work from. So our people did that. So my grandfather, Shawana Gizhi, calling his people together and engaged in that kind of a practice, again, that kind of a, a journey. So when he went to Sault Ste. Marie to Bawa Ting to put his name on the document to talk about what did it take make things secure, he talks about where my people live, those are reservation lands. So he used the word reservation. So we didn't speak about reserve. We spoke about reservation. And making a reservation, it's something that we do. Britain doesn't give us this power. European nations don't give us this power. It's something that we inherit from our ancestors in being born in, onto the land in this part of the world. That's what we call inherent right. So we carry that and we keep that. So we engage okay, with this kind of a presence okay, when we sit with Britain. So we allowed Britain to come and live with us. We allowed Canada to come to be present in our house. So when you look at the treaty, it talks about in the province of Canada. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Right off the bat, you're telling us a lie. Okay? Because we are not in Canada. We are not in Ontario. We're in the territory of the Anishinaabek. And you, you're forgetting. You're leaving that out. Because this treaty must accommodate that understanding. And that's what it does when the signature is placed on the document by the Crown official. It's recognizing our sovereignty to participate in the making of this kind of a relationship. To so recognizing our sovereignty, 
So there was some question about our stand and standing about who it is and what it was that we were coming from. It was with the knowledge that we were given life by a power that we don't understand. We speak about a Jem Nado being responsible. And that's all inside the, the teaching, okay? the view about the way that we see ourselves and about the way, the, the way that we see the world. Okay? That's still intact. We keep that. That's what's inside ceremony. So when we sit with Canada today, Canada is always trying to silence this presence that we bring with us. Okay? So inside, I was at a gathering not too long ago, speaking at Laurentian. So when Canada speaks of sovereignty, okay, the crown, they say, whoa. This idea of being sovereign. I said, you know, when you really take a look at what sovereign is saying, it's saying that I'm superior because I'm white. That's a very powerful thing to be saying. So we remind Canada that we too are sovereign. But I'm sovereign because I have a brown skin. Right? That's a gift that was given to me. So when you say you're sovereign with this kind of an idea that you can displace you can declare yourself to be superior. It's all nonsense. Okay? And that's what you're going to have to face now in terms of how you relate with me, being an Ishinaabe from a Tikmikshing. That's the correction that's having to come to, to be part of Canada's presence. Okay? So as to whether or not Canada can go there, is wanting to go there, is prepared to go there. They're not going to resolve any of the issues with the indigenous nations here in North America until they sit down and address that primary concern, because that's what's protected inside the making of the treaty. Okay? So when we sit and think about what we have and what was protected, it's our being free as people okay? to be an Ishnabic in my own home. That's protected. So when we take a look at the document, when you read the treaty, it talks about the first opening phrases. We transfer all the right title and interest. All that kind of language in the introductory phrases are dealing with ideas in, relation, in relationship to property title, object possession. Then I'm sorry, I'm not an object. I'm a spirit. You can't possess me. Okay? So inside the language, that's part of what the relationship is about. We respect you because you hold the same capacities. And the relationship that we make is about being able to accommodate these alternate views that we have about how we see ourselves as people from these varying dimensions. We haven't given away anything, but we have opened up a door through which you can pass to live together in harmony. So this lodge here, it uh, carries with it, within it okay, this kind of a background. That's what this fire is about. Okay? So inside here, if we draw a line going straight up and then going down, into the earth. We have within our teaching explanations okay, to look at those kinds of questions. And my, my good uh, neighbor and friend, okay, uh, Jacob Wawite, he's traveled to different parts of the globe to speak about Anishinaabek and Algonquin ways of seeing and being. Okay? Because that's what's here, the Anishinaabek perspective. So when we take a look up, we say, man was brought down. But he brought with him teaching that was given to him okay, by Creator. And he gave us those grandfather, grandfather Foundation teachings. 
So that's what's protected inside that treaty, the right to keep and hold okay, our foundation teachings to be Anishinaabeg. So in 1850, when you take a look at what the document addresses, it's primarily about economics. The treaty is primarily about economics. And now that's what's going to the court in terms of the, the process that is currently the, ongoing. Okay. Our Anishinaabeg people, signatories to the ones that participated in the making of the treaty, have gone to court with Canada okay, and with the province of Ontario. And inside, okay, there was a challenge by the judge, okay, she didn't tell okay, the uh, people that were going in to present evidence that she, she was going to put them through a test okay, about what we were speaking to in terms of the introductory phrases to the treaty. Seed, convey and transfer, land holding title. So that kind of concept, those ideas didn't exist in the minds of the Anishinaabeg when they sat down in the participation and making of that treaty. So, so how that language got in there is partly what's questioned. You can't say something and say people understood when it doesn't exist. So she tested the speakers of the language about the concepts, one of them being surrender and the other being seed. So inside the treaty, when you start talking about surrender, that word is not translatable. To surrender, it references the idea that I'm going to commit suicide. And suicide among our people is just not spoken of. And the words don't exist to describe that. So, so when you look at that, that treaty in the language that is written in, in English form, there's a lot of concepts that are in the document that cannot be translated into a Deishnabic thought. So that's what the judge was questioning. So she got the language speakers to translate okay, the treaty as it currently is in this modern language time frame. And the persons that were doing that work again ran into the difficulty. They could not translate seed, they could not translate surrender, and they could not translate property title of ownership land of the land. Okay? So that's something that's very important for our people to come to understand when we start talking about this treaty. You've got to sit down, and this is what the judges, and this is what the courts have been saying to Canada. You need to sit down with the indigenous nations to sit down and take a look at forming living arrangements that are going to meet today's needs. Because in the world that we are coming from, we cannot speak about land title, possession, of a, like an object. Because the land is not an object, it's a spirit. Oh, so when we think about what this treaty is saying, those are questions that our people are needing to reflect on. And this is what the treaty, not the treaty, but what the court case is uh, pursuing. Okay? The judge is saying to Ontario and to saying to Canada in trying to resolve issues related to, in relation to the treaty, sit down with the First Nation peoples, engage with them to form modern living arrangements. Because they still hold the interest in that land, which is what the treaty shows you. So in the document, when you begin to take a look at other issues okay, that are needing to be viewed, one of them has to do with the X that our partners okay, in uh, looking at the agreement 
And there was a phrase that's captured, not inside the treaty itself, but in Robinson's diary about what he promised at the time that the treaty was made. In his document, he says, it's only after I assured the chiefs that you will never be in want that any of them get up to go and put their X on that treaty document. So that part of the treaty making process is not registered on the document, but it's there in the X okay, by our people. Okay. So when you put the X on that paper, it says there's a sacred fire, which I am. That person is based, that participated in the making of this treaty as a spirit. Okay. And I secured unto our people the right to continue to keep my way of being, my way of living. And your signature on a document beside my ex secures that. So inside the treaty document, the signatures are important. The ex being touched by the chief and then when that symbol was made speaks to this higher level of uh, participation and abstractness about what was agreed upon. Okay? So in taking a look at what did we agree upon, we secured the life of our people. And we said that we would always come together. So in the term which relates to annuity, that's where it starts to talk about this need to sit down. Okay? So when we sit, and this is one of the, one of the issues that the judge is having to struggle with in uh, trying to decide on how to approach the encouragement of a an agreement of harmony. She doesn't want to impose on anyone obligation that is going to be potentially challenged. She's searching for that middle ground where there's a, a bringing together of the parties so that a future of harmony can be enjoyed. So when you think about this treaty, that's where we're having to travel. That's where we're having to go. So there's a, a long story that we have to walk through okay, to get to this okay, uh, better appreciation of what the document provides. So inside, <clears throat> in the case of a Thich Mek Shing, where it talks about the reservation of a Thich Mek Shing, it talks about okay, <clears throat> The, the, the water body here, the other side, is called a thick mixing. But it talks about coming to the homeland of the thick mixing people and going inland to the height of land about the thick mixing. So when you read the treaty, it's referenced inside okay, our description of the reservation block of land, but it's also described in some of the language which is used by the Crown to talk about the space of the territory. So it talks about coming into the Great Lakes and going up to the height of land that the Great Lakes is formed from, with the high territory about when you go up north, all the rivers that flow south into the Great Lakes that's the territory that's covered by the Robinson Superior and Robinson Huron Treaties on the north side. But then when it comes to the tick mixing, it talks about the territory of our people. So it talks about the river, the Vermilion, which for me here is over on the west side as I point in that direction. 
the, the Vermilion River passes up there. But the name Vermilion didn't exist. The Vermilion River used to be called the river that took you to the territory of the Tikmajin people. And it talks about the Wanapati River, which flows on the east side. The land in between the two rivers is the homeland of the Tikmajin people. That's the land that was sub defined by our chief in making the reservation. And when he made the reservation, it was for our people to, to make. We didn't need permission from Canada. We didn't need permission from Great Britain. We only exercised our own freedom to set aside a block of land for our people. And each First Nation that were signatories to the treaty have this, has a, having the same freedom. So I ask people, where in the treaty does it say that I cannot increase the size of my land base? There's no blocking us there because it's ours to define. So I can make my land base larger if I wanted to. It's larger now, larger than Canada. Because it goes from Lake Panage, it takes in Lake Panage, and it goes east and west from Lake Panage to the, okay, where the rivers, Wadapati River joins the French River, and where the Vermilion River joins the Spanish River. All the lands on the north side, going up to the height of land, that's the size of the Tikmajin Reservation created by treaty. So each First Nation has a description of what their lands are to look like in terms of how, to, how they're to be defined. But in the case of a Tikmajin, it's not resolved yet. So you know, in the case of our community, we were drawn into a court case back in 1883, back in 1887. And our people didn't agree with what occurred at the time. So when looking at the questions today about the city of Sudbury, in the little towns which are adjacent in and around. They're all on the Tikmikshing lands. Our sister community, Wanapate, there's a document that was produced. In, uh, <clears throat> after Confederation, Confederation 1867, five years after Confederation, there was a census taken of Canada. And there was a census taken of our people living here in this space, this territory. And there were nine communities that were identified as places where our people were living. That information and that evidence was not used in the court case where Canada was supposed to defend us. And even though this document and this information existed, Canada did not step up and use that information to defend our rights and interests. It was protecting its own interest in the court case, which was held in 1887. So we, we fell victim to Ontario pursuing its own needs, to Canada pursuing its own needs and wants. And we were left out. We became victim to their selfishness, their greed. And we said, we have to challenge that. But we've got to wait for a time when it's safe to go into the court. And it's now safe, so we're pursuing those interests in terms of what is to benefit the people of the Thich Nhat Hanh. And we're teaching as we're going through the process. We're having to teach our own people about the history of our community in terms of how we became partners in this living arrangement that we are in. Okay. So Canada is having to go back and visit the journey that it's uh, been traveling. And that's something that I've been participating in with the churches. I was, people have asked, what should we do? 
And my sharing with them has been to say, I would like you to go back. I would you like you I would like you to reflect on the journey that you've walked up to this point. And I would like you to take a look at all the transgressions that you may have participated in that has caused pain and suffering to the Anishinaabek people. Because that's what the polishing of the chain is about from the 1764 treaty agreement that we made with Great Britain. That's where you talk about the Silver Covenant. The Silver Covenant says we will sit from time to time as life changes, as circumstances shift. We will sit down and it's fine, the living arrangement that we are to engage in. But one thing you're not to do. One is you're not to try and evict me from my own home. First concern, you are not to evict me from my own house. And you are not to impose your government on me. That's going to cause me to shift away from my keeping of my spiritual fire. Because inside this fire here, when you begin to understand what it's about, it's actually a, a democracy. But a pure form of democracy, then what we see, we may go back and study the concepts that we look at to Greeks in Roman times. So here, inside, there is a respect and there's an accommodation of the freedom of a person. That's what Abinoji is describing. You are born sacred, you are born pure, you are born innocent, you are born with the right to life. And it's my responsibility to find a way that we can enjoy that, that uh, living arrangement such that we can both prosper. That's what's at the root of what this treaty is about. So when you read that treaty, it doesn't say a lot of this kind of thought, but that's what's captured inside that X that my grandfather put when he said, this is what we are going to make happen. Because it's a living agreement, not something that's carved in paper or stone and then put on the wall and then forgotten about. It's a day-to-day -day living arrangement among nations and among peoples. But the home that you're in is the Anishinaabe home. You're the guest. The European nations are guests. So that's a different kind of thinking that you're not being told about what the treaties say. But that's the foundation that's inside each of our nations across Canada in terms of the indigenous peoples. Our thought that's carried inside our languages, you see this over and over again, that kind of thinking. And that's what's so beautiful about learning to speak the languages. It shifts the way that you think and the way that you look at yourself and the world around you. It's, it's what we jealously want to guard and protect and secure. So it's taken us some time to find ways of being able to keep the language active, keep the language alive. But that's what we're charged with in terms of our responsibility. And we're working to secure that. So I share that with you in terms of this uh, <clears throat> talk about what this treaty is about. What does it do? What's its purpose? And something today that we need. It's a mechanism which is available. It's not to be feared. But it's a a useful tool, a healthy tool. Okay. It's a healing tool, but it has to be 
able to capture this idea of equity from both sides. Thank you very much.